so I'm Melanie Soderstrom, and uh, I'm coming to speak on behalf of the MIT Free Speech Alliance. And thanks for inviting me to come and talk. Um, okay, so uh, here's the plan for today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, which I don't normally do in talks. And then I'll spend some time describing what I would call the precipitating event, <laughs> uh, which is the Carlson lecture cancellation. Uh, I'm not sure how familiar people in this group are with that. Uh, and then some of the reactions to that. Um, I'll briefly describe um, the MIT's new ad hoc working group on free expression or FUG. Um, and then I, uh, I did promise Dan I'd talk about some things other than just the Carlson lecture. So I will talk on uh, about some other topics related to uh, free speech uh, on campus in general and MIT in particular. Um, I'll briefly go over the Chicago principles and then talk about um, MIT Free Speech Alliance's um, mission and our activities in a little more detail. And then we'll have some time for questions. Okay, so uh, I did want to um, start with who I am because this is really about uh, kind of uh, politically sensitive topics. So I just kind of want to frame where I'm coming from on this. So I am a female undergraduate alum of MIT. I was class of 98, so I was there kind of the latter half of the 90s. Um, and then I've been in academia since then. So I went to grad school at Hopkins, and then I did a postdoc at Brown, and then I came to the University of Manitoba where I'm currently a professor in psychology. Um, my free speech roots really come from my dad, who was, uh, and my American roots too, from my dad. Uh, he was an activist in the civil rights movement and the anti-Vietnam war movements. There's a picture of him in uh, Chicago Tribune burning his draft card. Um, and he was, he was actually quite active. There's some mentions of him in a book that was written about some of those activities. Um, and so I learned my uh, sort of love for free expression from, from him as I was growing up and really kind of from the left. And um, I've always sort of thought of free speech as being a, a leftist value. Um, so it's, it's a little odd to me now that it tends to be associated with uh, the right wing of politics. Um, I also learned from my dad a love of um, connecting with people across ideological differences because he, uh, he grew up in a very conservative household and over the course of many years had a lot of um, you know, interactions with his family uh, where people were talking across some pretty big ideological differences. Um, my uh, sort of more active interest in free speech and uh, academic freedom issues and other similar campus expression issues have kind of grown over the last few years over some of the things that I've been seeing on my own campus and more broadly. Um, and I've recently joined an organization called Heterodox Academy um, and have gotten active not only in the MIT Free Speech Alliance, but other free expression activities related to that. Okay, so enough about me. Um, so what is the John Carlson lecture and how did that lead to a bunch of discussion about free expression? Um, so the, the John Carlson lecture is a yearly funded public lecture. Um, it is normally, it normally in non-COVID times takes place in a large venue in the Boston area. It's not a typical colloquium style talk. It's uh, intended to communicate exciting new results in climate science to the general public. So it's, it's an outward facing uh, lecture, but it's a prestigious lecture and it's an invited one. So somebody from outside of MIT, as I understand it, typically gives this lecture. Uh, so in 19, uh, 2020, um, Dr. Dorian Abbott was invited to give the talk. Um, he's a tenured professor in geophysics at the University of Chicago. And the topic that he was going to talk about was exoplanets. Okay. And then, of course, what happened is COVID uh, reared its ugly head and the uh, 2020 lecture was postponed and his talk was rescheduled for October 21st, 2021. Okay, so, so far, you know, this is just COVID. Um, then what happened is that there was an opinion piece published by Dr. Abbott and another person um, that uh, rippled some, uh, riled some feathers, let's say. Um, and uh, so I don't know how familiar people are with the, some of the terminology that I'm gonna throw around, but um, if you've been in a corporate organization or on campus, you probably know what diversity, equity and inclusion is or DEI. Um, but this is quite a large umbrella term that refers to a variety of policies and practices uh, that are uh, increasingly prominent in campus life. 
uh, that uh, deal with all sorts of things uh, from how we interact with each other to who gets hired to what positions. And so this opinion piece that Dr. Abbott and his co-author wrote was advocating a different approach to uh, admissions uh, and um, faculty hiring uh, that they refer to as merit fairness and, merit fairness and equality. Uh, the idea being that DEI initiatives, um, they, they took issue with uh, some of the way that um, uh, race and ethnicity and gender and things are playing into um, hiring and admissions practices and we're proposing an alternative, okay? So this generated quite a bit of um, uh, discussion on social media, both inside and outside and MIT and uh, across academia. And, you know, so far that's not a problem from a speech, free speech perspective. That's, you know, what free speech is all about, right? We're supposed to be able to discuss things that people can disagree with um, quite uh, strongly. Uh, but what then happened was people were advocating for his firing and for his cancellation. So uh, recall that he's a University of Chicago uh, professor, not an MIT professor. So the University of Chicago weighed in and their response is what we as free speech advocates and academic freedom advocates would like to see is that the university stated um, that he has a, a, a right to enjoy free expression and to hold his opinions. Um, and, and that was that. Um, however, MIT took a different position and uh, ultimately canceled the Carlson lecture on September 30th, 2021. Um, So uh, in response to that, uh, so, so far there's been quite a lot of, you know, discussion on Twitter and internal discussion, um, and this generated yet more discussion, uh, and in particular, 159 members of the MIT faculty wrote an open letter to MIT, and you can still see that um, letter now if you go to freespeech.mit.edu, it's still there, it was published on November 3rd, um, and they asked uh, MIT to, um, improve the written commitment to academic freedom and free expression, and uh, specifically to officially adopt uh, the Chicago principles, which I'll describe in more detail at the end of my talk. Uh, so there was quite a few among alumni, including a lot of private emails. I sent one to the head of, um, of EBS. Uh, there were editorials, television appearance, and quite a, quite a bit of news coverage um, across a variety of um, news organizations of, uh, across the political spectrum. Another thing that happened was that in response to the cancellation, there was a group at MIT uh, in support of Dr. Abbott who invited him to give his lecture that he had planned to give for the Carlton lecture um, on their, at their university on the same day as originally scheduled. And it was actually quite successfully attended as I understand it, there was uh, quite an audience uh, that uh, attended that talk. Um, and so one of the other consequences of the uh, alumni reaction was the formation of the MIT Free Speech uh, Alliance in response to a lot of people getting together and expressing concern about uh, what MIT, how MIT had responded uh, to, uh, uh, to the Abbott affair. Okay, so uh, there are two official letters of response that we have uh, from uh, MIT itself. One is a statement by the provost on October, October 7th, 2021. Um, and he, he made it clear that it was the head of the department of EAPS uh, that had made the decision to cancel the Carlson lecture and not a dis decision that had occurred um, from the top down. Um, their position was, um, which I, I personally take some exception to, but uh, their position was that it was not a cancellation because it's not intended to be a lecture to other scientists, but was an outward facing lecture to the general public. Uh, I think that's a misunderstanding of the nature of, of academic freedom and free expression. Um, and also they pointed out that Abbott was still invited to come and speak to the department. Of course, this was a much less prestigious talk attended by presumably a relatively small number of people from within the department. Um, they also, the provost also uh, noted that the lecture is an outreach, is viewed as an outreach to the public and pointed to the idea that um, local minority high school students who might be interested in STEM careers, you know, that's considered sort of a recruitment tool for that. And based on, it, it, his position was that based on Dr. Abbott's views, Dr. Abbott could not reasonably serve as a role model uh, for these students. Um, uh, the letter further suggested that the controversy was overshadowing the purpose of this and spirit of the Carlson lecture. This was another um, argument for why they had canceled the lecture. 
Um, and it noted that uh, Dr. Vanderhilst is a valued member of the Institute. Um, okay. All right, so the second letter a couple of weeks later was from the president. Uh, the president indicated that he was deeply disturbed uh, by harassment of members of the EAPS community from outside of MIT. So as you can imagine, uh, as this became very increasingly newsworthy and, and spreading across social media, all sorts of people were weighing in, uh, some perhaps more politely than others. Um, and there was concern expressed about uh, how this was affecting uh, the department head. Um, the letter further expressed that freedom of expression is a fundamental value of the Institute, um, but suggested that the commitment to free expression can carry a human cost and that certain members of the community can feel unwelcome or illegitimate on our campus based on certain types of expression. Uh, that's the claim. Um, and uh, the letter noted that they were going to hold a faculty forum to discuss uh, what can be learned from the incident and then assemble an ad hoc working group. Uh, and uh, so I will get into the ad hoc working group in a second. Um, please feel free to, I, I can't check the chat, but if there's any quick questions that are that people would like me to address, please just jump in and ask them. We're a small enough group, I don't mind being interrupted. Okay, so the town hall forum. So there were some internal town hall forums that took place in mid-November, uh, some for faculty and staff. And obviously I wasn't in attendance at either of those, but they did take place. Um, and then there were uh, two town hall forums for alumni uh, that I was in attendance at one of them. Um, and uh, they were large Zoom meetings that took about an hour each, one in the middle of the day and one in the evening. Uh, and a significant portion of that time was actually taken with uh, the university presenting its own case and then remarks by the provost. Um, and then what they did was break us into relatively small uh, groups uh, for discussion. Um, and one of the things that um, we note on this slide is that there is quite a, a large number of kind of anonymous facilitators present in the room during these discussions, which really created an atmosphere that was um, a little unfortunate, I think, in terms of feeling like the, the university was actually wanting to hear what we had to say. Um, but to, to their credit, they did hold these forums and, and hear from us. Okay, so uh, the other thing that happened in addition to these forums was the formation of this ad hoc working group or FUG for free expression working group. Uh, so it was launched in January uh, and uh, it was uh, primarily made up of faculty members, but there's also representation across uh, the university, um, the various um, uh, stakeholders in the university. Um, and so they were given the mission um, to uh, address and report by the end of the spring semester um, and uh, the following topics. So whether MIT needs to update its policy on academic freedom, freedom of expression and or pluralism, um, uh, how to, uh, to better define the fundamental principles in a more structured way, um, how to make these policies prominent in the life of the Institute, um, and also to uh, come up with specific processes for negotiating disagreements and making decisions. So there was a sort of a functional structural element to this as well as kind of a, a policy and principle element to it. Um, uh, of note, the MIT Free Speech Alliance was specifically invited to come and speak with uh, Steve Baker, who's the um, Alumni Association president-elect in March, um, and five members of MS MFSA, uh, including myself, held a Zoom conversation with Steve, and we found that to be very productive. Uh, we gave our collective viewpoints on the value of free speech, um, uh, particularly within MIT, and, and what it means to uh, to hold those views within a preeminent uh, university like MIT. Uh, so it was supposed to uh, be out by now at the end of the, um, the term. And so hopefully any day now we'll be getting this report. Um, okay, so, huh. something's happening here. Okay, so uh, taking a step, so that's um, kind of the history of the last year or so in terms of free expression. And uh, like I said, if anybody has any specific detailed questions about this, I'd be happy to address those at that time before I go into sort of the larger topic. Okay, the I chat, will keep going. The chat has been 
we've had a couple of things, but the, the, we answered them ourselves. So it's not. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Um, so I think we can take, take a step back at this point and, and ask a larger picture question, right? So is the Abbott affair some sort of one-off, you know, thing that happened? Um, or is it indicating something larger about some kind of free expression problem on the MIT campus that needs to be uh, considered and addressed? So one of the things that we as an organization have done is to try and kind of get a handle on, on the, the bigger picture. And one of the things that has come out in discussion is a, an earlier incident um, that happened uh, with respect to a, um, a Catholic chaplain um, about two years ago now in June 2020. So um, that was obviously uh, in the aftermath of the, uh, the George Floyd um, affair. And what happened was that Father Maloney um, wrote a letter. So this was a very shortly after the incident itself. Um, and um, he, uh, he wrote a letter um, reflecting on what had happened and, and putting forward his own, his own position about um, how we as a community might sort of think about, um, uh, well, particularly the, the Catholic community within MIT might sort of reflect on, on the event. Um, and he made some statements in the letter that um, uh, it, uh, were, were certainly very controversial. Um, so he wrote, for example, that George Floyd was, um, so he, he, he states some, some important facts, like he was killed by a police officer and shouldn't have been. Um, people were concerned about his having referred to some aspects of George Floyd's life that were less than virtuous. Um, and questioned um, whether we knew, we knew at the time that it was an overt act of racism. Um, so this was not taken well by, um, you know, this was a pretty controversial thing to say in the climate uh, of the time. Um, and so uh, Dean Susie Nelson wrote a campus-wide email at the time uh, uh, responding to, um, expressing concern about what uh, Father Maloney had said um, and met with the archdiocese. Um, in particular, the dean said that that uh, Father Maloney's email contradicted the institute's values and was deeply disturbing. That was how um, the dean framed it. Um, in response to that, now MIT, as far as I understand, it doesn't have any direct say over the chaplains within in MIT. But it was clearly in response to the reaction of MIT itself that Father Maloney was asked to re resign shortly thereafter. Okay, so um, some, uh, but again, this is one incident and uh, different people can have different views about how an, inst an incident should play out. So we really need to have a, a sense of like the larger picture of what's going on at MIT. Um, and we do have some data around kind of the bigger picture. So um, one thing that, that was really striking is that the faculty town hall forums, for example, that took place in response to the Abbott affair, um, there were um, sort of informal polls taken and 50% of the attendees of the faculty forum, obviously this is a biased sample, but it's still a pretty striking number, um, said that they felt that their voice or those of their colleagues were constrained on an everyday basis. That's over 50%. And close to 80% indicated um, that they were concerned, uh, given the current atmosphere in society, that their voice or their colleagues' voices are increasingly in jeopardy. So that's really indicating that faculty are feeling the pinch. And I can tell you as a faculty member myself at another university that that, that number doesn't really surprise me. Um, furthermore, there is a, a FIRE report. I'll get into what FIRE is in a second. Uh, a report from uh, an independent organization that evaluates um, policies concerning uh, student free speech protections at public and private uh, four-year universities. Uh, and MIT's um, rating was, let's say, not at the top of the, the class. Um, so uh, Fs in terms of due process for uh, both sexual and non-sexual misconduct, a C in terms of its handling of Title IX, um, and in terms of the student survey on free speech climate, uh, we ranked 76th out of 154. So very much the middle of the pack. Okay, but I think that one of the things that's really challenging about getting a handle on the impact of on free speech uh, on campus is that a lot of the effects that take place are really very subtle. Um, so you, you may have come across the term, the chilling effect. 
Um, and this is really hard uh, to measure. So if there's a developing culture of fear of speaking out um, that results in people self-censoring, self -censoring, um, that's not the sort of thing that makes headlines, right? And so it can be really hard to, um, to measure uh, and to, to really understand the impact of that. Um, the other thing that's challenging is that we can look at policy uh, and we can, to a certain extent, get a, a sense of, of practice, but um, a lot of that is sort of opaque to scrutiny and it's it's in the eye of the beholder. So like one of the things that I've started to realize looking at policies across different universities is that you can have conflicting policies within the same university, one that's really pro free expression and then another that's really taking a much harder line stance with respect to certain um, DEI based concerns. And so how those dueling policies actually play out on the ground when an incident happens or when somebody's uh, you know, trying to decide how to uh, to act in a certain context, that can often be, um, you don't know, right? You don't know what's happening. Um, so here's an example. This is a, a quote from somebody responding to the Maloney affair. Um, so I know that there were several people who were upset about the circumstances under which Father Maloney left the Institute and their voices more or less got trampled by the predominant voices. Um, and so that's kind of a, a good example of the way that these kinds of things play out where um, it's not usually a big you know, affair that hits the national news. It's often these smaller um, sort of cultural effects that are really quite hard to measure. Okay, so so what? <laughs> we can ask, isn't maybe this is a good thing, right? Isn't, isn't so far we've talked about some things that people might actually believe um, actually are offensive. And so isn't it a good thing to stifle offensive speech, right? Don't we want to make everybody feel as comfortable as possible in their, their learning environment, right? That's a legitimate position that somebody can take. And so my perspective, I'm, I'm very heavily influenced by Nadine Strassen, who's a former president of the ACLU. Um, so very, very much from coming from the left perspective here. Um, and she says such restrictions are predictably enforced to suppress unpopular speakers and ideas, and too often they even are enforced to stifle, stifle speech of the vulnerable marginalized minority groups that they're designed to protect. So this is in her book, Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. I encourage everybody to read this book. It's fantastic. Um, she's talking specifically in this book about uh, the First Amendment and legal rights to free speech, but she makes it very clear in her book that she considers uh, university campuses and, and also even social media to be places that play a similar role in terms of supporting our democracy. And that from that perspective, it's really important that, um, that free speech be supported in these contexts and not just um, you know, the, uh, in, in the legal framework. Okay, so uh, a couple, I, I think I have some time to talk about some more um, examples of kind of how concerns about free speech play out across campuses. Um, and I, I do want to make clear that a lot of the really high profile things uh, often are affecting social scientists or humanities professors. And you, so you might think that uh, STEM focused universities like MIT are immune from some of these effects, but, um, but they're not. Um, so one of the concerns uh, th that's a rising concern with respect to free expression are diversity statements. Um, and I should say that um, as, as I'm actually somebody who is involved in, unlike some folks within uh, the MIT Free Speech Alliance, I actually have strong support for uh, certain elements of DEI and, and in, in, in particular um, moves to diversify um, campus. Uh, so in principle, I'm not against the idea of diversity, um, but uh, there's an increasing um, role of things called diversity statements um, these are used um, primarily in faculty hiring. They're more and more being used uh, in uh, graduate student applications. Um, we recently uh, had a discussion about them in my own department with respect to graduate student applications. Uh, it wasn't called a diversity statement. It was called a positionality and intention, uh, uh, intersectionality statement. Um, and, um, and also within scientific funding. Uh, and so these statements, you know, on the face of them, they, they're very laudable. The idea is to write a statement that describes how you're going to increase diversity within your campus or your department or your program or your laboratory. Um, and, you know, what are the, you know, what are the practices that you have? What, what you know, how can you, you know, contribute to this, this valuable goal? 
Uh, the problem is that um, on the ground, they uh, they are increasingly and easily function as an ideological purity test. So uh, the idea is that diversity statements is not a matter of, it's not any kind of diversity, right? It's certainly not ideological diversity or political diversity. It's a very certain narrow kind of diversity and only very narrow approaches to diversity are really considered uh, appropriate within these statements. So what it does is it actually narrows the pool to people who have very specific position, ideological positions with respect to um, things that are actually quite controversial in the larger context. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so uh, another, um, I just uh, put a couple examples here just to show that uh, cancellations can occur not just within um, uh, the humanities, but also in more STEM oriented um, contexts. So Steven Pinker uh, has a, a long um, association with MIT and he, uh, there was um, uh, an attempt to remove him as a fellow of the Linguistic Society of America for some uh, various tweets that he had made on important topics. And some of the things that they were accusing him of are, uh, I'm sorry, they're just, <laughs> I, I'm trying to, to stay somewhat neutral in my in my discussion here, but some of them are just so crazy. Like they objected to the use of the term urban crime because of the concern that it might be a dog whistle for some sort of racist ideology. Um, and uh, another example from uh, closer to, to home for me, um, is a chemistry professor uh, from Brock University who wrote a, 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 a journal article in 2020 where he was just reflecting on kind of the state of chemistry and had a number of suggestions for uh, of where things ought to go in the future. Uh, one of his suggestions, of, I think there were eight of them, um, had some connotations of suggesting um, uh, anti-affirmative action. And there was a, a huge backlash, backlash against this really well-respected chemistry professor resulted in the retraction of the article and like, his professional career never recovered. Um, and I believe he recently died. So that's kind of the end of the story for him. Uh, another thing that I would say in terms of kind of the, the landscape of um, free expression on campus is uh, increasing use of um, what's being referred to as proxy reprisals. So often universities will have, and this is one of the reasons again, why what's on paper and what actually is playing out in the ground can be very different. Um, so you can have a really strong commitment to free expression on campus. And then when somebody does something that's controversial, um, rather than uh, firing them or demoting them or what have you based on the thing that they did that you're unhappy about, um, you find some alternative reason for uh, firing them or demoting them or um, uh, what have you. Um, and that's what's happened recently with Joshua Katz at Princeton. Um, the last thing that I'll say in terms of these various impacts uh, of uh, concerns around free expression is the impact that it's having on science directly. Um, and uh, I can tell you a few examples that I've seen recently where um, retractions of, of journal articles have happened because of the impact of social media mobs. So somebody publishes something that people don't like, um, there's a big social media mob that gathers against them and then the paper gets retracted. Okay. Now, often there are legitimate concerns that are raised about the paper. Um, so um, there's one example I'm thinking of where it was a paper that uh, found some negative relationship between fe having female mentors and the success of your career. And so the problem is not that um, problems with a paper get identified. That's obviously an important part of the scientific process. The problem is that when this happens in a biased way, you're now gonna have an impact on the science where um, science that promotes a certain ideology is not subject to the same scrutiny as science that promotes the opposite ideology. And that's, that's very, very dangerous for science. Okay, I think I have, yeah, I'm doing okay here. So um, so what I've mentioned briefly, the Chicago principles. Um, so one of uh, our goals is to promote the Chicago principles and that was off, off also referenced by the, um, the, let, the faculty letter that went out shortly after the Abbott affair. So if you're not familiar with them, uh, the University of Chicago 
put out a statement in 2014 uh, in support of free expression. And the state, the original statement was specific to the University of Chicago, um, but it's uh, since been adopted by a number of other campuses, either directly or in, in a modified form. And so uh, it's become sort of a lingo for adopting a certain uh, approach toward free expression on campus. Um, so it guarantees that all members of the university community uh, will have the broadest possible attitude to speak, write, listen, challenge, and learn. Um, it says that the university should not shield individuals from ideas and opinions that they find unwelcome, disagreeable, or even deeply offensive, and that's important, um, that last bit, um, that concerns about civility and mutual respect can never be used as a justification for closing off discussion. Um, and the, that the goal of the university community should be not to seek to suppress ideas, but to openly and vigorously contest ideas that they oppose. So the idea is that if you find something offensive, you should talk about it and express that uh, rather than trying to cancel someone. Um, and then there are some exceptions built in based on you know, unlawful expression like incitement to violence, defamation and harassment. And there's also, uh, as I understand it, you know, some exceptions that are designed around the needs of a university community community to, to function as a university, but those should not be based on the idea that somebody might be offended. Okay, so the MIT Free Speech Alliance, um, uh, it formed in uh, November 2021. Um, our mission is to promote and defend free expression, viewpoint diversity, and academic freedom as values at MIT. Um, we advocate that MIT adopt a version of the Chicago principles um, and importantly make them sort of intrinsic to institute life. So we really wanna promote a culture um, that supports open dialogue and diversity of expression on campus. Um, importantly, we are strictly nonpartisan. Uh, so we are not a right-wing organization or a left-wing organization. If you're interested in supporting uh, free speech, you're more than welcome to join us. Um, we currently have over 800 public members and a number of anonymous members. We're about 70% alumni, but we also have some faculty, students, and friends. Uh, we are a registered nonprofit in the United States, uh, and we are developing uh, relationships with other partner organizations such as FIRE, which I mentioned earlier, um, which uh, used to be the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education and has recently changed its name to the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. It's taking a broader focus, uh, which is interesting. Uh, and you can find us at uh, mitfreespeech.org. Uh, we're also a member of a larger umbrella organization that is recently formed called the Alumni Free Speech Alliance. Uh, and you can scan over the list of folks who are also involved in that. Um, so what we've done so far, uh, the original thing that happened was a change.org petition that get, um, with respect to the, the Abbott cancellation received about uh, over 2000 signatures. Uh, as I mentioned, we met with MIT's free expression working group. Um, we've been trying to build advocacy through writing letters, position papers, blog posts, uh, things like that. Um, and we're trying to build a social media presence. Uh, so please check us out on Twitter if, if you tweet. Um, another thing that we've done is to set up an online hotline for members of the MIT community to tell us about uh, speech and viewpoint suppression. Uh, I wanna be very clear that this is about policy and practice, not people, um, as, as a lot of these um, social media storms have shown, uh, there can be real harm to people um, when, when they get targeted. So we wanna be very judicious and careful about how that information is used, um, but we, it's necessary for us to be able to get a, a handle on what's going on on campus. Um, we've also established something called the Concerned Donors Fund. So one of the things that happened uh, in the immediate aftermath of uh, the Abbott affair is that a number of um, donors uh, started refusing to uh, donate to MIT. And so we're, uh, we're trying to set up an alternative pathway for those donors um, for, for money to be used for um, purposes that are in support of MIT, but with the principles of, of free expression. Uh, and we recently received uh, a $500,000 grant from the Stanton Foundation uh, to uh, proceed with our mission. Okay, so the next steps for the MFSA are we're um, uh, working together with a student group on campus to host what we like to call the great debate. Um, and the idea there is to take 
uh, what happened with the Dorian Abbott and turn it into a positive and actually host uh, a debate on campus where we can talk about the issue of, of DEI and, and, uh, and debate it in a respectful forum. Um, we're uh, working with student groups and faculty and other MIT stakeholders to um, promote free expression. Um, we really want to focus on uh, students and on the campus culture because um, this is really what matters, right? It doesn't, you know, documents can say what they will, but what really matters on campus is whether there's um, a culture that supports uh, free expression. Um, and then to further develop our networks. And one of the really positive things that's that's happening in the last few years is that there's been quite an ecosystem of organizations uh, emerging to um, uh, support uh, academic freedom, free expression, um, uh, dialogue across differences um, that uh, can, we can work together with other organizations. Okay, so uh, what you can do, uh, hopefully this is something that you have an interest in, um, and uh, certainly MIT is continuing to reach out to alumni for feedback on various topics, so I encourage you to take action uh, and make your views known, whatever they are. Uh, if you uh, support what we're doing, uh, I encourage you to join uh, the Alliance um, and certainly uh, educate yourself and learn more about these issues as they emerge on campus.